Thank you, Ajahn. I'm, I'm curious, uh, it might not be such an exciting uh, question for some, but I know there are a lot of people who are encountering Buddhism around the same age that you did um, and who are thinking, oh, should I go to university or should I go to a monastery? And I think, um, yeah, for yourself and myself, I was in university and then ended up deciding to, to leave university when I was in my early 20s to pursue monasticism. And um, yeah, you came to the monastery at a fairly young age. And I'm curious if, if it's possible um, to give general advice to people who are in a similar situation, who have just encountered Buddhism for the first time and are very inspired and are, are wondering about this. Like, should they stay in the thought world of uh, Western 20th century, 21st century, um, America, Europe, or delve into the thought world more deeply of Buddhism and like go to a monastery, which is a great place to do that? Or is there value in in finishing up an education in, in the West? Like if I had finished my education in the West when I was in my early 20s, I wouldn't have had to come back now and do it in a sense. Um, I'm learning, certainly learning different things. Um, but if I had stayed in university, I might not have made it to the monastery. So curious what you what you think about that. Yeah, that's an interesting point because you look at how people come to Buddhism in, in Buddhist countries. You know, if, you, if you're born and grow, grow up in Thailand, Sri Lanka, these sort of places, people also have like different ways of really coming to the monastery. They might just do an, a temporary ordination uh, as a novice or as a, as a very young man and kind of get a little taste of what it is like to be wearing robes and being a monk. And then they might go back and work or, or study, finish the university. And then later realize, oh, that that experience was really worth it. I want to go back. And, and I know a number of, uh, say, Thai monks who have done it that way and who who have come back and then and then ordained as, as monks later on and stayed because they had an early experience of, of monasticism and it's something that's sort of in the culture, it's acceptable. So I think we are in the West now, uh, we are really at a different, in a different time, say uh, from the whatever, 1960s, 70s. Now I think we are actually born into a culture society where there's a lot of information available about Buddhism. It's much more accessible. There's the internet. Uh, you can also study, probably do courses just uh, on the internet, learn Pali, do various things. It's much more accessible, available. So much younger people now in the West can gain access and even physically go to a local monastery. Like if you live in Europe, in America, certainly there would be actual real Buddhist monks, uh, you know, living maybe not too far away. So it might be quite possible to actually, uh, you know, have that early acquaintance with uh, monasticism, you know, maybe go and stay at a monastery, sp spend, spend time there, extended periods of time, whether one actually decides to ordain or maybe do some sort of temporary, like an Anagarika ordination. Uh, um, or if some places offer temporary ordination, that might that might be a good step. But then it doesn't mean that one cannot go back and finish, uh, or at least continue for some time the university education, because that will prepare one uh, for you know for just later in monastic life. One might actually need these kind of skills; it might be very useful. And uh, I think we have to also just recognize that in in the context of the western monasteries that have been established we can talk about it later that how there might be different um different models or dif different ways uh, in which you know people live the monastic life so mm. certainly um yeah it's possible maybe to have a quite a intimate and close uh, encounter with buddhism even with monasticism and yet uh maybe go and and still finish even once normal education, and maybe focus on something really related to Buddhism also. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ajahn. It sounds like a very uh, balanced approach. And um, yeah, you're very right about the accessibility. And I, I definitely hope in this conversation that we'll get to uh, the variety of monastic lives or monastic experiences that uh, 
exist for for people to to tap into um kind of heading in that direction you talk about entering the, the thought world or the um yeah the world of of pali buddhism through the uh the tipitaka uh, but you also learn thai and i'm curious if um yeah if you're learning thai uh dhamma in thai um was different from how you learned dhamma in english like what is emphasized in um, from the Thai Kruba Ajans or great teachers that you were reading or listening to as, as opposed to um, the, the Western uh, Ajans who maybe grew up in a Thai system but you know, didn't ordain until you know, mid-20s, late 20s or, or later. Um, and yeah, what are the, um, maybe, yeah, just comparing those two, comparing and contrasting the Dhamma in English versus the Dhamma in Thai that you were, uh, were learning. Mm, yes, that's another good topic to discuss because um, maybe because of my particular approach, you know, when I came to England <clears throat> to be Anagarika, immediately, you know, I was there surrounded by a, a culture that there were a lot of Westerners, uh, but also quite a few Thai people coming to the monastery. We had some Thai monks staying with us, Thai lay people. And I was very curious, very interested in their, you know, their culture, the language, and uh, I felt a kind of uh, closeness to, to that whole world coming from Asia. Um, I was attracted to that. So I was uh, trying to pick up, at least learn the Thai, uh, the Thai language uh, enough to be able to, to read, like, what's the title of this book, you know, who, who wrote this book? Uh, the, the Thai characters, <clears throat> so I, I learned that pretty quickly, but then actually getting to speak Thai and getting into the whole language, that took much longer because I wasn't really able, there was no kind of formal uh, study program offered at that time in the monasteries in England, and um, so I didn't really progress very much with my Thai studies until later when I went to actually live in uh, in Thailand and then uh, went to live abroad but in sort of more Thai Thai based monasteries actually uh, places that were set up or, or run by Thai and Lao Lao people so I was forced to to listen and and interact with them every day uh, in that language and that that's where I really picked up um, the language much quicker uh, being surrounded by that kind of environment and then when one was able to you know learn enough to just communicate and start to learn from conversations um, then at some point I, I, I picked up a, a Dhamma book and I tried to listen to some Dhamma talks that was one way of learning was in those days there were just tapes audio tapes and occasionally we would get a tape from somewhere in Thailand, which also had a um, like a sentence by sentence English translation, they were quite rare to get, and and you couldn't. It wasn't really word by word, but you could get a, a sense for the for the actual dhamma phrases that were being used, and that's a really good way to learn when you have to learn these kind of idioms and those particular ways that the dhamma is being talked about in say in the Thai language, and what helped me, of course, was my previous study of Pali because so my I think this was really great advantage to somebody who hadn't learned Pali, Pali before I mean just the spelling of all these complicated Pali and Sanskrit words in Thai in Thai script must be terribly difficult to learn for someone who doesn't know Pali or Sanskrit uh, to start with but for me it was actually very easy though those were the easy words to <laughs> decipher and, and learn was just finding out how to pronounce them in the in the Thai Thai pronunciation. They change the way they pronounce these words. <clears throat> so I realized that Thai language, it's really first of all, it's not a Indo-European language. It's more it's closer to Chinese, and uh, and it really works very differently from Indo-European languages. But they have taken over <clears throat> a huge amount of words from basically India through Buddhism and Hinduism. So maybe more than half of the Thai vocabulary these days comes from Pali and Sanskrit. 
and just to see how the Thai language works and these particular idioms and the, the, the way that these words are being used. It's very interesting uh, for me um, because I, I could really understand the whole kind of cultural background and uh, you know, historically, how did these ideas sort of evolve and uh, what kind of role do they play in, in the say, modern Thai language these days? You know, when you listen, say, to the news in Thai, you know, they might still be actually using terms that come from our uh, Pali Vinaya terminology. You know, that we study uh, and we study some Pali Vinaya texts, but they are applied today in a in the context of the uh, let's say the Thai Parliament and various uh, roles and functions that are <laughs> that are being. Um, in the in the current sort of Thai parliamentary system, because they've just taken them over and, and used them in a, in a new context. Sometimes they also change the meaning slightly, so the meaning has shifted. Um, but it just gives you a very uh, much more kind of deeper appreciation of a language if you know if you know all these different um, sources of various ideas. And uh, so there is one. One thing I can recommend, people ask me, you know, should I learn Pali first or should I learn Thai first? What would be better? Maybe maybe it's quicker just to jump in straight into the into the Thai sort of, uh, world, you know, and go and live in a Thai monastery and quickly learn how to chat with the monks there. Yeah, you can do that. And it's probably very useful uh, because you will be able to talk about like pr practicalities of daily life. Um, but what I've often noticed, even with some monks who have lived in Thailand for a long time and even learned Thai to a, a, a good a good degree, still they might make mistakes or they, they have some misunderstandings or uh, say the spelling will be uh, different because they misunderstand where did that particular word come from. They would have learned it in a Thai context only and they don't know where that word originally came from in the Pali context. And sometimes I noticed a number of occasions, you know, people will make like, well, but use it maybe wrongly or just misapply it because um, something has shifted or they haven't understood one particular aspect of it. So, yeah, it just gives one a kind of greater depth of understanding the, the, the language. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. I, as you were talking, I was thinking about, I mean, one of the most um, common words in Tha political Thai language is Nayok, or like the prime minister. Um, you know, that comes from Pali, Nayaka, or like the leader, or the lord even, you know, like the Buddha was called a Nayaka. So, you know, basically taking a, a name or an epithet for the Buddha and using it for the prime minister is an interesting way of, I won't necessarily say co-opting, but uh, yeah, using that term. Um, Yes, I'm, exactly. I'm... It's it's a good example that one, the Nayok, or there's lots of like Vinaya terminology that is that is applied uh, mm. in say the Thai legal system also, like the um, you know like the when somebody accuses somebody and the the defendant and all that. That these these terms are just taken over straight from the uh, you know chapters in the Vinaya Pitaka right. that discuss you know how to deal with arguments. <laughs> all that yeah. but there's also the there's yeah there's also the that aspect you mentioned of learning dhamma from the thai ajahn so that that's one other thing i haven't mentioned yet is that um yes just coming to learn dhamma in the western context say in in england or generally anywhere in the west you notice how much um adaptation there has been you know when say you can first learn the Pali Sutta. So if, if you if you just go for the earliest texts and have a good basis in in the Pali Suttas, um, you know, okay, the early early teachings, okay, that's a good basis to have. And then you, you build on that. Uh, you learn, say, the later you talk, uh, learn about the commentaries and uh, uh, all the kind of later Buddhist teachings on, that came later. You understand the kind of historical development a little bit how the ideas uh, changed and then but a lot of people uh, in the West they just uh, come to the Dhamma straight in straight English just get it in English or in German or whatever uh, 
some kind of Western language. And if you bypass that kind of linguistic aspect of it, uh, I think there's scope for a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, I've noticed many times when you know you discuss some Buddhist term or teaching, just say in English, and somebody will listen to it and they will like pick up, pick up one particular word and start to analyze it or make some uh, um, conclusions just based on the English language, uh, not realizing that this is just an approximation, really quite a quite a crude maybe approximation to what the original say Pali term was. And people like that, they don't make the extra effort to say, maybe ask, well, what is really meant by the, by the term? You know, maybe we need to go a little bit deeper and ask, uh, you know, what, what, what does this term really stand for? That would be, say, my approach. But if people don't realize where these words come from, they might be talking about, you know, Buddhist teachings just based on, on English, really quite in, imperfect English terminology. And that feeds into their pre-existing uh, say linguistic, but also cultural assumptions that come from a, a very non-Buddhist culture. So, or our sort of Judeo-Christian, you know, ideas, you know, terminology, or even if you come from like a philosophical perspective, you know, all these different words that, that we, we use to discuss Buddhism now, you can't just sort of take them and, uh, apply them within that context because, uh, you know, they are just all the references are to a different culture, different concept. So it's almost kind of necessary, I would think, to have some kind of linguistic, bit of a li linguistic approach to, to fully understand the, 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 the Buddhist teachings until you build up that kind of thought world, uh, you know, enough to, to really have a more accurate representation of you know, what, what we are talking about. And even more than in the in the context of the Thai Thai tradition and the Thai teachers, because uh, the way it works in Thai is, um, say the say Thai forest ajans, they might be uh, giving these kind of more informal talks, and yeah, they might not have studied a great deal. They probably studied some of the Naktam books. Or all the kind of knowledge that they have is really based on the. the the Pali terminology, the suttas, the Visuddhimagga, some commentaries. And around that is probably a lot of just Thai culture, which again is based on broadly speaking, you know, Buddhist or Hindu ideas and a bit of animism mixed in. So that's the kind of context within which they speak. And, and now you have to be able to really kind of empathize with, with that and be able to understand what, what they mean when uh, if, if one translates maybe uh, literally like a, a Dhamma talk from a Thai Ajahn uh, and doesn't isn't careful enough you know with the interpretation it might lead to misunderstandings or maybe oversimplifications and uh, I think sometimes translations were the early translations were maybe not so not so good because people maybe missed out on some of the finer nuances of what they were talking about uh, and that was maybe the tendency to to just make it make it feel like something Westerners will understand, you know, making it sound more like a Zen like a Zen teacher, or you know, making Ajahn Chah sound more like a Zen Zen uh, master, when in fact, you know, he's really quite firmly based in that whole kind of thought world of the Pali Tipitaka commentary, Visuddhimagga. That's that's the terminology he's referring to. Yeah, gosh, there's so much there. I mean, uh, so you, by this time, have already learned, you know, quite a few languages. You've gotten, you know, glimpses into this world through through German at first, and then through English, and through Pali, and through Thai. And in my experience as well, learning Pali and, and Thai, um, it just kind of rounds out this, this thought world that you're kind of getting more and more three-dimensional picture of, like, even, you know, it's wonderful to learn Pali, um, but just getting Dhamma from texts um, prevents, or presents somewhat of a superficial and somewhat of a heady approach. Like when I was first learning Thai, I made a point to go through, you know, those 108 uh, Dhamma talks of Ajahn Chah way before, you know, I maybe, I listened to, I think all of them, you know, when I probably understood maybe 15%, but still, you know, I could listen 
And just hearing Ajahn Chah like talk to junior monks especially, it's like, oh my gosh, there's such heart to this, which you don't get a picture of, certainly not in the English talks that I was reading or the Pali texts I was reading or even the Thai texts that I was reading. Like in Ajahn Mahabua, you know, you can read his books and just get this idea or other Thai Kruba Ajans who've been translated, you know, get this approach that they're only extremely fierce and um, this kind of, you have to be a warrior, basically like green beret type, you know, um, struggler to be able to approach Buddhism. And when you hear Ajahn Chah just laugh, you know, with the junior monks, it just kind of breaks your heart open. Um, um, yeah, yes, so definitely. I agree with that. That the the lived con I mean the living contact with some of these teachers is also uh very, very useful. I I learned a lot from just yeah, seeing them interact with people and how they how they teach. Um this is something which is hard to get just from the transcribed talks, from the books. One can, you know, imagine various things about how these teachers were, what were they were teaching. Um and then some of the English translations I would like to maybe point out, there's there's a, I wouldn't necessarily agree with all of them. And um, because I think some of the Westerners, even some of the early like Western monks or translators, I think they were bringing their own understanding of the Dhamma in, into their translations. And um, say one, one example is like some, Sometimes there's like uh, various metaphysical like assumptions about these uh, uh, sort of ultimate questions of Buddhism, ultimate uh, goals. You know, what is what is nibbana? What is it like? Is it is it uh, what is the kind of uh, 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 pure citta, pure mind? What is uh, is it eternal consciousness or is it uh, what are the five khandas like? And if you even on the linguistic level, if one already has an assumption, you know, what the goal is like, then one will tend to translate, say, a, a, a talk by a Thai, Thai Ajahn in accordance with that assumption. And um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with some of these translations even because I think people have brought in their own assumptions into those translations. And then other people just read them later in English, not even know what was said in the Thai. And make even more interpretation based on that further strengthening their <laughs> assumptions so for example the the way the word chitta is used in pali in in the in, say in the flow of a pali sentence talking about the five khandas and and then the word chitta gets mentioned here and there and somebody who doesn't understand pali very well uh will say oh look here the buddha is talking about five khandas that's one thing and now there's this other thing called the chitta and uh, that's something else. But and, but in fact, if you understand Pali and, and how language is used, how these terms are used, it, it might not be like that at all. It's just another word of referring, say, not, just another way of referring to the same experience. And one time you can analyze it in terms of uh, five khandas uh, in one particular context, and then two sentences further down, uh, it, the same can be referred to as a, as a kaya in chitta. You know, the body and mind, because there's, that's just another way of referring to it. Say more uh, everyday language would be would be like that. But then someone can look at this and construct a whole uh, metaphysical theory about this, uh, saying that uh, there is this thing called the citta, which is a uh, something completely separate from the five khandas, and these five khandas are kind of surrounding this citta, and um, and uh, the goal of the practice is to uh, liberate this chitta from from the five khandas and make it into a thing. You know, it's like reifying one particular concept or idea just based on a maybe a linguistic misunderstanding. And the word chit in the way it's used in Thai again is not the same uh, usage as it is used in Pali. So there's just one one example that uh, I noticed. Uh, sometimes people making all kinds of interpretations, assumptions. They are actually maybe just just due to a linguistic misunderstanding. Yeah, that's a great point. And even like another translation of chitta or jit is jai, like heart. You know that can be easily misunderstood. So having these multiple references and really, 
you know, trying to get out of one's own biases around things, but it's hard when, you know, even the texts that are chosen to be translated are based on some kind of bias of, of the translators, what is being chosen to uh, be translated.